So our next speaker is Dr. William Zogby, who's the uh, chair of cardiology uh, at Methodist Baker Heart and Vascular Center. Uh, I think uh, Bill should not be a uh, new name or new face to any of you. He's a past president of ACC and the past president of American Society of Echo. Um, and I'm sure he's president, gonna be president of many more things. Uh, you know, Bill is gonna talk to us a little bit about uh, Echo and specifically Echo Doppler. And just to give you a, a kind of an idea, you know, uh, Bill was actually the chair for the valvular heart disease guidelines that came out in 2013 that were recently updated uh, earlier this year. And now that he's got so much time on his hands, he's working on updating the prosthetic valve guidelines that he put out, you know, about eight or nine years ago. So I don't know how he uh, finds time to sleep, but uh, please give a warm welcome to Bill Zogby. Thank you, Dippin, and it's great to have you here. Hopefully you're enjoying yourself and you, will, you won't be on the passive end of receiving, okay? You'll interact one way or another. Just, uh, I'd like to know how you heard about this program. Uh, did you hear about it through your uh, program director? Raise your hand. Or by your own research or whatever it is, some other format. Okay, looks like some other formats, mostly. Because we're trying, obviously, to, to uh, get hold of you one way or another as your first year, and I know you're very busy trying to accommodate wherever you are. How many of you are outside from, from outside Texas? Hmm? Quite a few. That's great. I mean, that, that's the importance is to, you know, get you involved one way or another and get a crash course. Uh, Echo Doppler. I'm pretty sure every one of you have, has ordered this test one way or another, right? Is, is that correct? I'm pretty sure. I, I don't have to answer, uh, you don't have to answer that question. So what I'd like to do in the next 15 minutes or so is to give you an overview of where is this methodology, where are you going to need it in your residency and beyond and fellowship and beyond, and to end actually with some caution because yes, this is a non-invasive methodology, but you are the stewards of this healthcare system and you need to order it appropriately, okay? Because you're not gonna harm people with ultrasound uh, because all these methodologies have been approved for safety. The energy is not that high, although you could dial up the energy and uh, basically break gallstones with that, right? But for ultrasound imaging, uh, it is very safe in the safe methodology, so that, that's not an issue. And what has happened over the years is the principle is the same. I have a transducer that emits ultrasound, so it's in the megahertz ra range. It gets reflected, and based on the tissue properties and how far the ultrasound is that is reflecting the tissue, you could decide the depth of that structure, so you could have space, depth from time, and then, so that's one, that's for imaging, from M mode to 2D, et cetera, et cetera. So that's one. The other one is, I ask a different question. I'm sending sound with a certain frequency and gets the Doppler effect, which we'll talk about a bit. And the Doppler effect tells me that if a, 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 there is a motion of that object, and in this case, red cells or the myocardium, what's the velocity of that? So that's Doppler. From the same instrument, asking a different question of how reflecting the structure is or how deep the structure is to what happened to my sound and ultrasound that I sent and how fast did it get reflected? What's the change in frequency? So these are the two, this is the basis for all this family of techniques nowadays that you could have from mega size to the pocket size that you ca carry with you, and the pocket size doesn't have all the blows and whistles that you have with the bigger machines, okay? So you have a picture here of various echocardiograms. You have on the left lower, and you have a contrast echocardiogram, which enhances the quality of your, of your images, and you have 3D. So let's go through that. Standard imaging views called parasternal view, long axis of the heart, short axis of the heart, apical views, apical four chamber, two chamber, long axis, but basically tells you where am I putting my transducer and in the subcostal window. 
and which axis of the heart am I imaging? It's long axis or it's short axis. And this is an image for you, not from a 2D, but from a 3D echocardiogram in real time. Nowadays, it has improved significantly though, so that you can get what we call them volumes per second, meaning heart volumes per second. You can get up to 30 or 40 or even 60 volumes per second, which is close to real time. On the right side is an image of from the apex of the heart, looking at the, vent at the ventricle and the mitral valve, and you can see the mitral valve nicely opening and closing. So we talked a bit about Doppler. So this is a frequency shift, and you don't have to remember this you know, velocity equation. Basically, from a frequency shift, I can derive my velocity. The most important part of this equation is cosine theta which tells me that if I'm at an angulation, I will underestimate what the velocity is. Where is that important? When you, when you look at gradients, aortic stenosis, many other things that, are, that could be angle dependent. And therefore, if my angulation is above 20 degrees, if the flow is going in this direction and my ultrasound beam is more than 20 degrees, I will underestimate what those velocities are based on the Doppler equation. And therefore, from a technical point of view, the majority of you are cardiology fellows or even anesthesiology, you need to understand that. You need to understand this principle and you're gonna learn how to get these ultrasounds if you're gonna be even a level two echocardiographer, certainly a level three echocardiographer. So what's the property of this? If I know what the velocity is, of the blood cells in different chambers, I can therefore quantitate flow. Why? Because I can estimate what cross-sectional area of flow is in the left ventricular outflow tract or in the RV outflow tract, but also more importantly, in valvular disease. So we talked about spectral display. This is the spectral display. I can uh, combine that with cross-sectional area. Also, I could have color Doppler, which is a simplification of this equation. Uh, and you could see there on the uh, right side, uh, you could see here a mitral regurgitation jet. You could see an aortic regurgitation jet from the aorta. So it's great for screening purposes and a quick display. How do I get gradients? You at times see in the reports, well, the PA pressure is this much and the gradient is through the aortic valve is this much. It's a simplification of the Bernoulli equation, which tells you that I can estimate pressure from velocity squared. So four times velocity squared is your estimation of the gradient. And you can go through that through your training. Most importantly for you is to look at the general applications. Where do you order an echocardiogram and how important that is? One, the uses is, if I need to know what the chamber size, chamber function, severity of valvular lesions. Is there a pericardial effusion, yes or no? In atrial fibrillation, obviously you look at left ventricular function, left atrial size. Endocarditis, you're looking at a lesion on the mitral valve or the aortic valve or any of these valves. Stroke and peripheral embolization and aortic dissection. So basically almost any area of the heart except looking at the coronaries because you don't have that resolution to go to the coronaries. And this is an example of a 2D from different views long axis as well as short axis, the vast majority of your ordering is gonna be to evaluate ventricular function, particularly in the adult. And then also some of that is, is there hypertrophy, yes or no, somebody with hypertension, what the ejection fraction is. But don't use this EF as, you know, this is it, this is all I'm gonna ask about. There are so many other things that you can get in that echocardiogram that you need to know. For ventricular function nowadays also we use strain which is a deformation of the heart. Take a look at the left upper there, and this is strain in real time. And what strain is, is deformation. How much did the heart deform during the cardiac cycle? In the lower panels, you can see an abnormal heart, obviously, where you have akinesis, almost dyskinesis of the apex, and all that can be quantitated without you putting your hand on it. It's almost automated. It has some applications, particularly in cardio-oncology, when you're looking at early decrement in ventricular function in cardiotoxic drugs. So I think this is where uh, you know, the important uh, applications are. Let's see if we can go forward here. 
So ventricular function is important for you post-MI because it prognostically is very important in patients with chest pain, dyspnea or heart failure, abnormal EKG, cardiomegaly, systemic hypertension, cardiotoxic drug, we talked about it, and before major surgery. If you take a look at this panel of echocardiograms, you have different patients with heart failure. They look differently. On the left upper there, you could take a look at the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy as opposed to a dilated cardiomyopathy, as opposed to an infiltrative one where you have thickening and this depressed function and somebody with regional abnormality post myocardial infarction. So it can give you an idea about the etiology of heart failure. And I think this is the importance of echocardiography is ventricular function, diastolic function, prognosis, pulmonary hypertension. Almost 20 years ago, this was validated here in these laboratories by Dr. Naga, who I associate, to look at estimation of ventricular filling pressure using Doppler technology. What we combine is mitral inflow, what's the flow-like pattern coming through the mitral valve, which is what the tissue Doppler tells us about myocardial properties. Do a ratio of that, the E over E prime ratio, you may, you're gonna hear about it. And if it is more than 14 or so, ventricular filling pressure is quite elevated. Pericardial effusion is among the first applications of echocardiography in the early days of Harvey Weichenbaum. You could see in this patient here the effusion around the heart, and there are some constrictive elements too, so constriction, effusion, all these are important. Valvular heart disease, the crux of what you do in ultrasound, probably it is the best technology nowadays to evaluate valvular heart disease, particularly the hemodynamics of it, an aortic stenosis, mitral regurgitation, aortic regurgitation, and they're like. And the importance is not only to evaluate a murmur, but also once you identify somebody with valvular heart disease, you wanna make sure that you follow them and find the optimal timing so you're gonna repeat serially from time to time, every one year maybe, six months, or a few years down the line to see what happened to adaptations to the pressure or volume overload of uh, uh, this particular situation. So I think this is crucial really uh, in these uh, clinical scenarios. Now, endocarditis is another issue. And endocarditis, you're gonna look for vegetations with some complications, abscesses, transesophageal offers a superior quality, better resolution, but particularly for the base of the heart. You could see it here very nicely. It's a large vegetation uh, on the mitral valve, and you could see a 3D display of it. We haven't talked about TEE, and the reason we haven't talked about it is the vast majority is transthoracic approach. TEE has its special place where it is great at the base of the heart. You're coming from the esophagus. So it's gonna give you a great resolution for the base of the heart as opposed to the apex. So the advantage of a transthoracic is an apical thrombus, apical abnormalities, right-sided structures, as opposed to a transesophageal where left atrium, left atrial appendage, uh, mitral regurgitation at times that could be hiding, prosthetic valves, something at the base of the heart and uh, that would be very important in aortic dissections. And you know, clots, that's how they can be quite impressive in the heart, in the apical areas, and they're actually best seen with transthoracic echocardiography. Few of the cautionary things, but to end. One is, not everybody going to surgery needs an echocardiogram. Unfortunately, you're gonna see this wherever you practice, and you gotta be careful about that, because routine pre-op examination is really not a place for an echocardiogram. If you have cataract surgery, that's minimal surgery. You don't need any evaluation. Even individuals who have hypertension or other things, if they are asymptomatic, that's not an issue. If they have symptoms, obviously you need to find out. If they have heart failure, that's the big one. If they have symptoms of heart failure, yes. If they have question of heart failure, yes. Okay, a routine pre-op is a class three, which is really not needed. Uh, yes, it is a changing world, all right? Now, uh, you may feel the pain, or it may be so anesthetic that you may not feel it, but you're in it, right? Uh, and it is very important. And the reason why, at time, why we talk about this is over the past few years, the cost from medication, medical therapy, healthcare is exponential, particularly for imaging. And that's why the ACC went through these appropriate use criteria to act to translate the guidelines into something that can be you know, put to the bedside. 
and you're going to have them in your training gradually, actually in 2019, you're not going to be able to order an echocardiogram or an MRI or a CT unless you identify the reason why you're doing it as opposed to just, I'm a doctor, I want to order it, all right? So you're going to need that. And always, whenever you order a test, any of the tests that you've heard about, think about its diagnostic accuracy. Is this really the best investigative test that we have nowadays that we have so many other tests, and that's where appropriateness comes to play. A list of you of where echo is not cost effective, okay? Routine checkup. Asymptomatic has nothing, right? You come in with somebody with chest pain. I mean, they have chest wall pain here. You don't tell the, the patient, oh, I'm just going to need to get an echocardiogram for you or a stress test just to make sure, okay? Because the false positive rate becomes, you need to know what the prevalence of disease is, right? Patients with palpitations, a full, a full normal exam, EKG, and everything else, okay? Uh, elderly with stroke who has a definite indication for th I mean, atrial fibrillation, what are you looking for? I don't know what you're looking for, all right, unless there are some other things. Innocent murmur, if you still know how to listen to somebody, right? A very tiny murmur doesn't need an echocardiogram every time. And let me tell you, I've seen echoes ordered for headaches, okay? It is too far. It's just too far out, okay? Too far out. I don't think you're going to get... Any, any answers for your headache and what to treat them with, and it is not cardiac in origin. And this is our team. We love our team because it's all comprehensive. We look at the patient's education and research in a comprehensive manner. All imaging is under cardiology, and we love that. And you, you've seen the interaction here because then you could tailor the examination to a particular patient. You can educate your fellows in a single room almost where all these modalities are there together, interact, and, and plan hopefully for research to change the field going forward. Thank you very much really for coming here and spending a few days with us. Hopefully you'll really enjoy it and, and get to learn something that you could apply when you go back home.